call to order the meeting of the many how creek watershed district board of managers may twenty fourth two thousand and eighteen all managers are present except managers miller and locked as manager shackle finishes is just moments away a few feet away is there any member of the public who wants to address the board on a matter that is not on the agenda sir if you come forward to the sure. microphone and begin with your name and your address Well, I'm uh, Dr. Paul Silverstein, and uh, thank you all for allowing me to come, and uh, I appreciate the efforts that all of you put in for this. Um, let me just explain that I'm uh, representing Excuse me, the, sir. I'm sorry to interrupt, but would you tell uh, us your address also? Oh, I'm sorry. I will. Yeah, well, I was going to. Um, I'm representing the uh, management board at the condominium that is at uh, 555 Oak Ridge Place in Hopkins. Um, if you don't know exactly where that is, it's uh, right off the frontage road off of Highway 7, and we're between Eisenhower School and the Korean Church, kind of set back from the road. And I was one of the original occupants when that building was constructed uh, 12 or 13 years ago. And uh, it's a lovely building, and if you haven't been there, we'd invite you all to come. Um, this early spring, or perhaps late winter, we received information that a developer was coming into that area to develop the empty lot that's immediately west of us. That lot has been vacant, you know, forever. Um, on that lot is a wetland, and that's why I'm here tonight. Uh, we have some issues with the uh, nature of the development uh, this developer is proposing. And amongst his proposals are a downgrading of the wetland area. Now, uh, the wetland, uh, this time of the year you can't even see it because it's uh, uh, hidden by some very mature oak trees that are at this point fully leafed out. But during the fall, and of course spring, you get a pretty good view of it. And it's a lovely, very tranquil area. And my wife and I and others in our building have been down there to enjoy its tranquility and just the beautiful part of nature that it uh, affords us. Uh, we learned, and I'm just about done, I, I know I don't want to take too much time. We learned uh, that... Uh, uh, the staff of the watershed uh, department has had uh, an analysis done and I think is about to make a recommendation to the board to change the category from a level 5 to, I believe, a level 2A. Uh, obviously, I'm not versed in any of this, but from the reading that I've done, that's my understanding. Uh, the uh, Analysis, I think, was uh, prompted by the developer, Mr. Roger Anderson, uh, who owns Anderson Engineering. And uh, uh, your staff sent me a copy of the uh, engineer report, uh, the environmental report, that was done by Mr. Hodap. And uh, it was interesting, because Mr. Hodap is an employee of Anderson Engineering. Uh, Mr. Hodap has very good credentials, and I don't want to say anything to be dismissive of his report, but I, I just wanted to call you, that to your attention. In any event, uh, we would like the opportunity as a board to come before you when the uh, material is actually formally presented to you and then present our objections. And my only purpose for being here is to just, uh, I guess in a sense, announce what our intention is and call your attention to it as well. So I appreciate the opportunity of being here and I'll be happy to answer any questions. I don't want to delay your uh, formal agenda. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wesker, did you have a something to add? Uh, President White, uh, managers, just want to thank Mr. Silverstein for coming in this evening. 
Um, staff is aware, obviously, of uh, the concerns and has been processing the permit application um, to this date. And it has not been publicly noticed yet. And once it is publicly noticed, there'll be an opportunity for members of the public to uh, request a, a presentation in front of the board of managers for further consideration. So, Thank you. Um, and it is um, part of that process, part of that application process, applicants can evaluate wetlands using what's called the Minato Minnesota routine assessment method, right. where they go through a series of evaluative criteria and look at what the management classification of wetlands are on site, which then drives how the watershed district permits wetland buffers and uh, other levels of impact to wetlands. So. Um, the applications in process okay. spoke to staff today. I understand that it's not complete, so it hasn't been noticed. Once it is, uh, the members of the public can request that it be presented in front of the board, and then you'll get all the information at that point in time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Thank you for allowing me to appear. Thank you. All right. We'll look forward to seeing you all again. We'll see you again. Yeah. Is there any other member of the public who wishes to address the board on a matter not on the agenda? I see no hands. Um, may I have a motion to approve the agenda? So, so moved. I'll, Manager Becker, second by Manager Rognes? Yes. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any <clears throat> opposed? Um, we have a new staff introduction at this point in time, and I'll call on Ms. Cermak and Ms. Sylvia. Or just Ms. Cermak. <laughs> <laughs> President White, Board of Managers, um, we're here tonight to introduce new staff. I just wanted to get a few quick words in first. Um, as you know, the Research and Monitoring Department has gone through a lot of change recently. Um, it's been quite a long transition for us and, you know, somewhat heavy-hearted. Um, but I can say on behalf of our work group that we're really excited about the work we have coming out of the pipeline. Um, we're pretty energized and we're really excited to have Brian Beck join our team next week. Uh, we've worked with him a lot in the past and he's really going to bring a fresh perspective to our work group and a lot of new skill sets. So we're excited about that and we're really excited to have these two gentlemen join us this summer. Um, they're going to be in the role of our temporary field assistant and we did have some flexibility built into that position when the org chart was designed um, to kind of allow for changing monitoring schedules and some special circumstances, one of which being my paternity leave that's going to be starting somewhat soon. Um, so these guys are going to be really instrumental in carrying that work forward, making the transition really smooth, focusing on anchor monitoring as well as diving into our diagnostic work with effectiveness and stormwater. So with that, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, absolutely. President White, Board of Managers, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you here tonight. Um, my name is Alex Skirto. I am one of the new research and monitoring field assistants for this season. Um, just a little bit about myself. I am a recent graduate from the University of Minnesota here in the Twin Cities. Uh, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in geography and accompanying minors in earth science and sustainability studies. Um, since being here, I've had some professional experiences in the field of natural resources. Um, I spent a summer as an aquatic invasive species watercraft inspector for Carver County. Um, I also spent some time interning for Great River Greening, um, mainly involved with public outreach and coordinating uh, volunteer restoration events throughout the metro area. Um, I'm very excited to be a part of this team here and uh, get some real hands-on work uh, with some of our ongoing and future projects here. So, thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, President White and uh, managers and any concerned public. Um, <laughs> my name is uh, Tom Tully and uh, I just graduated from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point in uh, water resources and actually I am uh, a member of the watershed. I grew up in Orno so it's a big um, pleasure of mine to take part in this organization and I look forward to that very much so. Um, I'm working with my fellow co-workers and uh, it's been a great experience so far and uh, I can't wait to work on, on it more. Bug you guys some more. So, thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Glad to have you.
President White Managers, um, I'm also here tonight to share a staff update for the permitting department. Um, as you know, the permitting department structure has shifted to promote retention uh, within the department as a result of the human resources plan that the district is implementing. Um, these changes included establishing a third uh, permitting technician within the department and then also um, making two permitting assistant positions that are full-time staff and also receive uh, benefits as well. And so, um, as you know, the, the third technician joined us at the end of last year, called Thompson, and tonight I'd like to introduce um, our two permitting assistants that joined us earlier this month. And so, I'll let them go ahead. Uh, President White, Board of Managers, I'm Will Roach. I am a 2013 graduate of Winona State University, where I majored in geoscience and minored in sustainability. Some of my past work experience includes working in Lyon County, Iowa as a program technician for the Farm Service Agency. Uh, recently, I've been working as a conservation manager for my family's farming operation. And here at the district, I've been learning a lot about the permitting department, what goes into regulating and reviewing a permit and site inspections. And uh, I would just like to say I'm very excited for this opportunity, um, not only to work alongside uh, conservation, fellow conservation-oriented individuals, but uh, the opportunity to protect and enhance our natural resources as well. President White, Board of Managers, my name is Megan Shermers. I'm the other new permitting assistant for the watershed. Um, I graduated uh, University of Minnesota Duluth with a degree in geography and minors in environment sustainability and geographic information science. I have a background working in natural resource management. During college, I worked at Hartley Nature Center in Duluth and also for the Department of Natural Resources at Gooseberry Falls State Park. Um, like Will, I'm learning a lot about the permitting department and how we function. I've been working with applicants and guiding them through our permitting process and also reviewing projects um, pre, during, and post construction, implementing our rules. I hope to continue learning how to help communities and homeowners create a sustainable environment that protects and preserves our natural resources in this area. Welcome. Great. Thank you. I can pull out my I'm not a young person card here and say there are majors that weren't at my college. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. <laughs> well, people knew, Bill. People knew. <laughs> On the consent agenda, we have this evening approval of the May 10th board minutes. Uh, approval of the checking registers for the general checking account, the surety account, and the 325 Blake Road account. And we have item uh, 7.1, 7 which is resolution 18-050, <coughs> authorization to execute programmatic maintenance agreement with the city of Edina. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Manager Olson, is there a second? Second. Manager Shackleton, those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Thank you. Um, President's report, update. Um, I attended a, um, um, in Wyzetta, the Lake Effect open house last week. Uh, they were bringing newer iterations of their thought process forward for public response. They showed three options for that parking lot down by the, by the uh, Lake Street and Broadway. One was all parking, one was all park, and one was a hybrid and we're asking people to fill in. All of them showed a bike path along the south side of Lake Street with a trench there. I think I'd call it a trench, a long trench to handle all the water that comes off Lake Street. So it wasn't a lot of difference from what I'd seen before, and I think that our staff are continuing to work to follow that process. Um, I think we all received an update from Emily Javins at Maud of the end of session legislative Item. So I just wanted to mention two things, one of which Anna Brown mentioned in committee is that the Lassard Sams grant was approved as a standalone as on the governor's desk, I believe, at least as of yesterday. And the other is that the limited liability for commercial salt applications was removed from the omnibus bill, so it did not get through the legislature. And I would just recommend um, or refer everyone to the remainder of the report um, for the rest of the items. And I, it's in front of us. Okay, there's a printout. Thank you. Um, I believe that's all I have. Planning and Policy Committee met earlier this evening. Manager Rodmans, can you give a report? Um, yes. Um, we uh, had a really good discussion of uh, uh, sort of uh, pre, uh, uh, before we be began our, our capital uh, improvement plan consideration and 
kind of connected everything to um, the the work that we we did on our, our comprehensive plan over the last uh, uh, number or two years. Um, we also uh, had a discussion on Wyzetta Bay easement consideration of a, a particular property there, and, uh, and that was uh, that was interesting. And uh, uh, there was an update on the uh, Minneapolis Southwest Harriet flooding feasibility uh, update, uh, which is being considered uh, in conjunction with uh, uh, the park board and the city. And uh, we also uh, did a, uh, an update of the uh, Six Mile Creek Halstead Bay Habitat uh, program, uh, which uh, is getting uh, started this summer and we'll go into uh, 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 a year from now. Um, and that was essentially it. Thank you very much. Do managers have any other meetings or events to report on? The upcoming meeting and event schedule is shown um, in our agenda. At the next CAC meeting will be uh, Manager Loftus is assigned to that. Um, and we'll move on to item 10.1, which is permit 18-147 for 3100 West Lake Street in Minneapolis. Ms. Showalter. Thank you, President White, managers. I'm here this evening with uh, permit 18147, which is 3100 West Lake Street. Um, this permit is here before you at the request of a member of the public um, and with some concerns in regards to the stormwater management. Um, so that's how I'm going to be focusing my presentation. Um, I am going to start with some brief background um, and then briefly touch on the erosion control rule and staff recommendation as well. So this permit is located uh, the project is located on the northwestern corner of the Day Macosca, formerly known as Lake Calhoun. Uh, it's located at the intersection of West Lake Street and Excelsior Boulevard, just to the west of Dean Parkway. Uh, so I'm just going to first give you an idea of how water works in the property. Um, so the property in, that's the subject of the permit is outlined in blue, and it's the southern parcel. Um, the parcel to the north um, is related in that um, there is an underground stormwater system shown in yellow that um, discharges to the storm sewer on West Lake Street um, through some pipes that run through the subject property. Those pipes are not connected to any stormwater infrastructure that's actually treating water on the subject parcel, um, but it does run through that property. The existing site has an underground infiltration system shown in blue that also discharges to the Lake Street storm sewer. And the proposed condition, that um, outlet from the northern parcel will remain, um, and then a, an underground filtration system will be added. Um, the filtration system is a closed system, so it's lined. Um, water will enter from manholes, um, from catch basins and drainage on the property um, into the filtration system where it will be have pollutant removal <coughs> before discharging into the storm sewer. That water will not have an opportunity to leave the system. Then there will also be an underground infiltration system on the south side. Um, and the infiltration system is designed to encourage water to enter those underlying soils and recharge the aquifer. Um, additionally, uh, this is an area um, where we, we know a fair bit about groundwater. Um, groundwater in this area moves on southeast towards the lake. So in the proposed conditions, um, the applicant is going to be increasing impervious surface by about a quarter of an acre. And based on the scope of the development, they'll be required to treat the entire site's impervious <coughs> surface. So with that, they are provide, they're required to provide about, about 4,000 cubic feet of abstraction, which they are providing through an infiltration system and a filtration system. Um, the filtration system require, it has a 50% abstraction credit. They're additionally um, required to meet rate control, um, and they're doing that through uh, decreasing the runoff rates for all storm events. 
In addition to that treatment that's provided, they also, um, the permit was reviewed for infrastructure design and then impacts to downstream water bodies. So based on the materials provided, the, application, the proposed um, plans are in conformance with the stormwater management rule. Uh, just touching briefly on the erosion control rule, um, it's pretty stand, they're you know, required to, um, to provide both perimeter, you know, perimeter control um, through silt fence um, at construction entrance and inlet protection, and then also a permanent stabilization plan. All of that that they've provided is in, also in conformance with the rule. Um, so since the application is in conformance with both of the rules triggered, staff recommends approval of the permit. Mm -hmm. This was requested by a member of the public. Is there someone here who wishes to speak to this permit? I see no hands. Manager Shackleton has moved approval of the permit. Is there a second? Second. Manager Rodness. Any questions for Ms. Schulwalter or discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Permit is approved. We'll move to item uh, 10.2, which is um, permit 17-367. And Ms. Quinn. Good evening, President White, Board of Managers. Um, this evening, I'm presenting permit 17-367 um, for a two-lot subdivision on Casco Point as the applicant has requested a variance um, to the minimum buffer width requirement. This evening, I'll go through some general background, uh, the rules that apply to the project, uh, describe the variance request, and conclude with the staff recommendation. Uh, so where we are in the district, uh, the property is uh, located in the city of Orono. Um, on Casco Point, which is um, in Carmen's Bay, uh, kind of situated in an odd area of Orono that's kind of between Tonka Bay and Spring Park, kind of near the Navarre area. Um, just zooming in a little bit more, um, the subject parcel that we will be discussing this evening. Um, so it's these uh, three parcels on the point there. Uh, the applicant is proposing um, to replot them into two parcels, which was approved at preliminary plot um, to the city in September of 2017. Um, so here are the existing site conditions. It is an undeveloped parcel. Um, the applicant is proposing, as I mentioned, uh, to replot the existing three parcels into two, construct two single family homes, and then um, also construct a, a shared driveway to access the lot. Um, Constructions of the homes will trigger the district's erosion control rule, uh, floodplain alteration. They do propose to install two beach sand blankets, which triggers the shoreline and stream bank stabilization rule, uh, wetland protection rule, and then the requested variance. Um, the project is exempt from the district stormwater management rule. Um, single family homes are exempt from the district stormwater um, requirements and a uh, subdivision and are required on a uh, subdivision of three lots or more on a greater acre. So since this is a two lot subdivision, uh, the rule is not applicable. Um, the applicant has provided the necessary erosion control, including a double silt fence, which is shown in red, and a rock construction entrance, which is highlighted in blue. I'd also like to note that this gray area in the middle is a construction staging entrance as uh, vehicles won't be allowed to park on Ivy Place uh, per the city's requirement. Um, for floodplain alteration, um, the image on the left here is the existing conditions um, and on the right is the proposed. The district's approved 100-year floodplain for Lake Minnetonka is 931.5. Um, the applicant is proposing to bring in um, about uh, 1,228 cubic yards of fill within the floodplain and are providing storage of uh, 1,313 cubic yards, um, which will result in a, a net gain of 85 cubic yards of, uh, of floodplain storage. Uh, these plans have been reviewed by the district engineer, um, and he has confirmed that um, the, the existing volume on the left is uh, floodplain volume is 562 cubic yards, and then the proposed scenario will be 
647 cubic yards. Um, there's no work, uh, there's no new impervious surface proposed in the 10-year uh, floodplain uh, of Lake Minnetonka, and the uh, low openings of the homes um, are proposed at, well, the low floor elevation is proposed at 934, which provides the required two feet of freeboard above the 100-year. Um, the plan as proposed meets the district's footprint alteration rule. Uh, the applicant proposes to install two sand blankets highlighted in red um, on the, kind of the northern portion of the um, site. Uh, both of the beaches will be 25 feet in length and, that, uh, and be installed 10 feet waterward from the ordinary high water level, which is uh, 929.4. Um, any, as I mentioned, the wetland protection rule is triggered, and I will discuss that uh, next. Um, any wetland fringe that is present uh, in front of the ordinary high water level would be DNR public waters wetland. Um, per the DNR guidelines, uh, they allow the installation of sand blankets in public waters and in public water wetlands as long as it does not cover emergent vegetation. Um, the applicant has included these uh, specifications on their plan sets as well um, and therefore is in conformance with the district's requirements and under the uh, general permit we have with the DNR. Um, so moving on to uh, wetland protection, uh, there are two wetlands that have been delineated on the site. Wetland A is the fringe wetland that goes um, pretty much around the entire peninsula. Um, and then wetland B is a small wetland in the middle um, that's present here. Um, the delineation was approved. Uh, the, the district is the local unit of government for the Wetland Conservation Act, and we approved the boundary and type in 2016. Um, the applicant is proposing to completely fill the 168 square feet of wetland B uh, through the de minimis exemption within WACA. Uh, you are allowed, it is a type 1 wetland, you are allowed to fill up to 400 square feet of a type 1 wetland without providing mitigation. Therefore, no mitigation is provided for the proposed impact. Uh, the applicant has also um, applied for temporary impact um, of 150 square feet um, for this portion of wetland A, which is adjacent um, to where the driveway is to be installed. They are not, the applicant's not proposing impacts uh, to the wetland. However, um, working with staff, uh, we, we came to an agreement that there would be a restoration plan in place uh, that the contractor can point to um, that would fall within no loss criteria in the event that there is unintended impact. Uh, the district recognizes WACA exemptions and no loss criteria, therefore there is no mitigation required under the district's wetland protection rule. As in Blanca. Uh, the buffer provisions of the room um, are, are required for single family homes or 25 feet. The applicant has employed buffer averaging, um, showing the wetland buffer um, boundary in green on the site here and kind of the hash marked areas, all wetland buffer. Um, they are, through averaging, they can reduce the buffer down to 12 and a half feet and out to 50 feet, which they have done so and maintained at all points with the exception of the uh, 69 linear feet highlighted in yellow um, for the pinch point where the driveway comes in. I'd also like to note that the northern portion circled in red, there is a proposed four foot mulch trail uh, that kind of meanders throughout the buffer there. Trails are allowed within the buffer as long as that area is applied to the base buffer width, so that portion of the buffer has been bumped out to 54 feet. And then there are also two four-foot wide trails um, to provide riparian access through the buffer uh, for the proposed sand blankets, which are not uh, required to be added to the uh, total base buffer area through averaging. Um, large portions of this buffer area will be disturbed through site grading for the construction of the homes. Uh, the applicant has provided a maintenance and monitoring plan in accordance with the district rule. And they also um, have shown the location of buffer monumentation. I'd also like to note that although they are not meeting the minimum buffer width of 12 and a half feet for that 69 foot variance request, uh, they are providing the required buffer area. So um, if they, through um, averaging, they would be required to apply um, 
28,826 square feet of buffer and they're providing 29,414. Oops. Um, so the, um, the proposed plan was the exception of the 69 um, foot linear foot shortfall of the minimum buffer width requirement. Um, the wetland protection rule is not otherwise. So moving on to the uh, variance request. Uh, to request a variance, the board must consider that these are special conditions inherent to the property, that the hardship is not created by the applicant, that granting the variance is not a convenience, that there are no alternatives, and that the um, intent of the rule will still be met. Um, so I'm going to just kind of explain a little bit more here visually for you, the board. Um, so this is the existing uh, site condition. Um, and the, the public road right away actually ends here. And there's an existing uh, easement over private property that was recorded in approximately the 1970s. Um, it's with the intent to access the site. Um, and so that is an easement that is currently in place. Um, through the preliminary plot, um, outlot A has been plotted out um, for the shared driveway, so there'll be one drive to access both of the homes. And um, that's about 30 feet in width. Uh, the city requirements for a shared driveway um, are 20 feet in width for the driveway. Um, and so highlighted in red there is that access easement um, and then also like to note where the, the wetland I'll show you on the next slide where the wetland buffer is here <clears throat> um, the applicant did look into moving this existing easement further northeast um, which would allow more space between the access point and the wetland fringe um, however there is an existing structure on the neighboring property here and this is their, their private drive as well. And so it was determined that um, they're not able to, to move that instrument further northeast. So kind of zooming in a little bit more, the, uh, the area where the buffer width is not being met is highlighted in that orange color there. This is the uh, existing easement access. And here is where the proposed driveway is. Um, and so I would also like to, the applicant did provide us with information where they um, originally had proposed a eight foot driveway in this area, which would meet the um, allowable requirement that the city allows for width within the lakeshore setback for a driveway. Um, as I mentioned, they do require a 20 foot driveway for a shared driveway for safety reasons. Um, and so when they proposed the eight foot width um, through planning commission and recommendation at the fire chief, um, the driveway was extended to 12 feet um, for access purposes and safety reasons. Um, the homes will have sprinklers installed in them and that was how they were able to reduce it from the 20 foot width. Um, so just kind of giving you a visual again of what this looks like because it's, it's hard to see on the plan set. So here's our access point is right here. Here's our, our wetland here. So essentially they're proposing to come through the easement here. Um, and then as you can see, the driveway does turn north pretty much as soon as possible. Um, so it will kind of come through where this uh, boat house shows up, here, which has actually been removed. Um, and then turn north as soon as possible. So um, the applicant has requested a variance for meeting the minimum buffer width requirement uh, for that 69 linear feet. Um, staff feel that this is, they've shown um, that they didn't create this hardship as they did not uh, in, create the easement access uh, since it was recorded in the 1970s and that um, there's no feasible or prudent alternative to access the site by land. Um, although stormwater management is not required, they are providing two underground um, filtration systems uh, shown in the red circle here. Um, staff did some math and for the um, 
69 linear feet of driveway that will drain through um, the wetland buffer that is less than the 12 and a half foot requirement will result in 828 square feet of driveway that filters through a narrower uh, buffer strip. Um, the, although stormwater management, as I mentioned, is not required by the district, it is being provided and they will be treating the roof runoff. Um, since this did not go through in an engineer analysis, this is my rough math um, estimation. Uh, the site in general will introduce 0.42 acres of impervious surface of that um, approximately 0.27 acres are for the um, homes themselves. And so for roof runoff, um, approximately uh, uh, around 11,000 square feet of water will be directed to these underground BMPs and provide some filtration that way. Um, and so they are providing a greater stormwater benefit um, from capturing that um, than the shortfall of the um, about 800 square feet of the driveway that's draining through a less than 12 and a half foot buffer strip. Um, kind of just zooming out again, this is a, I would say, medium density residential area. Um, the shoreline is, is predominantly developed in this area. Um, and then want to kind of conclude that they, to meet the intentions of the rule, they have provided more buffer area than required. They have a rather robust planting plan um, that does include um, three different zones of native vegetation um, that if the district has reviewed um, and, and incorporation of tree plantings as well. Um, so to conclude um, my presentation, staff would like to recommend uh, approval of the permit on the conditions listed in the report and um, summarized here again. Um, and then uh, find that there is um, factual, that the applicant has provided factual statements um, and technical analysis stated in the variance application. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Is there a motion to get this approval of this permit before us? Madam President. Minister Smith. Uh, again, we'd recommend that you act first on the variance request with uh, a motion that would address the findings in the staff report. Thank and you. then once you've acted on that, turn to the permit. Thank you. And I neglected to ask whether any member of the public here wished to speak concerning this permit. No hands. Um, so then going back, may I have a motion to approve the variance? So moved. Manager Olson, is there a second? Second. Manager Robbins. Questions for Ms. Quinn? Manager Olson. Okay. <clears throat> on the left side, <clears throat> excuse me, on the what I would be the west side of the peninsula there, we did a pilot project, sh uh, shore restoration work about six years ago. Mm -hmm. Who is maintaining that and who would maintain it under the ownership? <clears throat> Thank you, Manager Olson. So um, this slide here depicts um, that area. Um, that is the uh, shoreline stabilization easement uh, shown here. That is to remain. It's not proposed to be moved. Um, and I have been in contact with city staff. They have confirmed that the city is maintaining that and continues to be responsible for that. We do have a, a existing declaration that was tied to the 2011 permit. Um, for this area, which outlines the maintenance responsibilities, um, which outlines the city as, as maintaining it. And I um, did get an email um, from city staff saying that the, the city would continue to maintain it and be on their inspection uh, cycle. After the homes are built, they'll continue to maintain it. That, that, is, that is what I was provided uh, correspondence. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? I live on Ivy Place, <laughs> half a dozen houses away. So I have a lot of concerns that my neighbors share about this, but none of them gave the permit recommendations. I, I too, am very concerned about that um, shoreline stabilization area and concerned that because of how tight this is, that even the best intentions um, don't guarantee that there's not going to be some infringement on that protected area as well as the, the wetland buffer. And so, is there a way that we can, I'm sorry, I asked for the variance motion. We're talking about the whole thing. Um, is there a way that we can especially ensure that that is not interfered with? 
Yes, thank you, President White. Um, so the, the plan specifications that have been provided with the um, exemption of the variance request do meet the real requirements. Um, staff also recognizes um, the, the proximity to natural resources on the site. Um, and so we do have a, an approved plan um, in the intent that, in the event that there are unintended impacts to the wetland fringe um, through the driveway installation, um, which will also be used as the construction entrance. Um, and then in, to ensure that the shoreline, we have the, the declaration to fall back on. Um, staff already intend to make this a high priority for um, active compliance during construction. Um, and that's kind of how we will ensure that things get done. Um, we also will be holding um, financial assurance um, for the for erosion control, so that they make sure they maintain what they plan to do. And then also for uh, wetland protection. Um, so we will be holding $5,000 for three to five years to ensure that the, the buffer is um, established as planned. So the variance, to reiterate, is to um, allow them to be closer within the wetland buffer than the 12 and a half feet that would normally be provided in Correct. The I don't average. have the, oops, the exact width throughout that 69 linear feet, but I can zoom in a little bit more to show you. Um, here the buffer is indicated to be 24 feet, which would be allowed in averaging. And shortly after that, um, so this is probably approximately about 24 feet as well. This might be just under half. There is a pinch point here, because um, this is right at the, essentially the wetland edge, where it is uh, 1.8 feet away from the wetland fringe. Um, I don't have quantified for how many linear feet that is. Um, I just have quantified for the um, area that the buffer is not being met and the linear footage that is underneath the 12 and a half foot requirement. Thank you. Are there any further questions? All those in favor of approving the variance, say aye. 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 Any opposed? I'm going to abstain. Um, so the variance is approved, and now uh, is there a motion to approve the permit subject to the variance and the other conditions and stipulations as reported um, by staff? So moved. Manager Becker, is there a second? Second. Manager Sh uh, Shackleton, discussion or questions? Those in favor, please say. Uh, I, I, Manager Shackleton? Yeah, Olson has figured out first. Okay, we'll take Olson first. <laughs> Sorry. Um, while you were up there, I was going to ask a question. The catch basin that they're putting in at the end of the driveway, you said? The catch basin. Sorry, Mr. Olson, no. can we repeat your okay. question? There are two basins that are up on the east side of the for Starwater. <clears throat> my, my question is, how are they diverting the driveway water? Where does it go? Manager Olson, you're asking where the drainage from the driveway will Correct. go. The drainage from the driveway will be pitched towards the lake. Um, from my understanding, um, they're installing a drainage swale here to mitigate runoff that comes to the site to mm -hmm. ensure that uh, they don't flood out the neighbor property here. Mm -hmm. um, and then the houses the go houses that the, will be built up, yep. so the site will drain yep. downwards. And, and they're leaving those two storm mitigation. So these systems. are the, they're underground right. systems. Yep. <clears throat> but there isn't anything down here. I thought there's I no them. treatment proposed okay. down here. Correct. Just want to be clear. Thank you. I was going to ask the same thing about flow, the sheet flow on, on the. I know it has no bearing on our permit. I, the letter, the letter we received today would indicate that the neighbor. Oh yes, thank you, Manager Shackleton. I apologize. I did want to acknowledge on the record that uh, I received correspondence addressed to the board um, from the the neighboring resident Jay White, and that was distributed this afternoon. 
if any, if the board has any questions about his correspondence, I'd be happy to address them. What happened? I have no sense. I only read the letter. Mm -hmm. Does, I know it has no bearing on this. If, if Mr. White's concerns are borne out, how would um, mobilization on this property occur? If I, understood, <coughs> if I understood correctly, Mr. White didn't want to, to have access across his property. Um, Manager Shackleton, I um, interpreted um, Mr. White's letter to state that um, it is an existing easement that was there when he purchased his home. Um, that he kind of gave a timeline of the history of the property, which uh, was helpful because I had kind of a, a smaller 1970s timeline. Um, and then to the second point regarding um, the eight foot wide versus 12 foot wide driveway access. Uh, an eight foot wide driveway in this location will still require a variant from the district's rules. Um, and that um, I spoke with legal counsel earlier this afternoon um, and it's uh, staff's interpretation that as the easement was in place prior to the um, applicant purchasing the property it is not a hardship that the applicant created. I didn't think it had a bearing on our decision. I, I was more, I was more, okay, I'll just leave it at that. Don't worry. Just, I, I, I basically am wondering if, if the contention is borne out and the applicant is unable to access the site via the existing plan, mobilization <clears throat> would occur lakeside? Andrew Shackleton, uh, that's a good question that um, I, I don't have the answer to. Uh, yeah, I, I, that would it, This would be the only access point by land, so I guess the other option would be by barge. People do build on, on big islands. Uh, that would sure. be absolutely impossible. Thank you. Are there other questions? Those in favor of approving the permit, please say aye. 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 And once again, I will abstain. Thank you, Ms. Quinn. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Heyman, you have item 11.1, um, resolution 18-051. Please proceed. Uh, good evening, Chair White and Managers. I'm before you this evening with Resolution 18051, um, selection of a master developer for 325 Blake Road, and authorization to negotiate terms and conditions of a master developer agreement. Um, go through a little bit of the timeline. Obviously, this has been a process that's been ongoing for about five months or six months, dating back to when we released the RFQ in December of 2017. Um, we've gone through a couple of uh, phases of responses, both to the original RFQ and then again to a supplemental information request. And last time in front of the board, which would have been in early April, the board had authorized uh, the, um, to initiate the interview process for 325 Blake Road. Um, that, um, that process included advancing three finalists to the interview, uh, to the interviews which were to occur on May 9th. Those, uh, Master developers were Anderson Companies, Dorn, and Krauss Anderson, and I've listed their, their teams, their respect, uh, respective teams with each of the um, firms that was, uh, was interviewed on the ninth. So that interview process, as approved by the board, was facilitated by the joint working group, which you'll recall is the subquora of three board managers and two city council members. They acted as the interview panel for the um, interview process. This, the Southwest Community Works Blake Corridor Subcommittee um, were present and acted as observers and then participated in the uh, facilitated deliberation following the interviews as advisors to that joint working group. Um, there were themes that were provided to the developers in advance of the presentation to focus on elements such as affordable housing, site infrastructure, community space and community engagement, as well as their ability to perform. And the joint working group in coordination with the subcommittee and board also um, 
work through a, a variety of questions or topical areas that they wanted to address through the question and answer component and those related to the partnership philosophy. Um, the Minnehaha Creek Greenway integration, so the investment that the district is planned for with the site and our continued involvement on the site, uh, as well as community engagement, some sustainability components, as well as um, developer-specific topics. So the, the interviews overall uh, went quite well. The, the joint working group and subcommittee, they, they were in concurrence that you know we had three really strong, viable development teams that had the ability and, and wherewithal to deliver the site. And after consideration of the two rounds of written responses and the additional information provided in the reviews, there, there were some topics that they talked about that would maybe help differentiate which, um, which master developer team would, would sort of rise to the top. And so through the conversations and those deliberations um, that afternoon, we really wanted to focus on the redevelopment vision and the ultimate site use, um, the alignment with the partnership goals that had been identified by the city and the district, Southwest Community Works, Blake Road, uh, Blake Road, um, Blake Road Corridor Collaborative, excuse me, uh, as well as partnership ability and um, just overall leadership cohesion. So based on, uh, on the deliberation and the discussions and all that information to date, the joint working group um, uh, picked Kraus Anderson as the preferred candidate that stood out amongst the three finalists that were advanced interviews um, and passed a motion to advance that recommendation to the board of managers um, to, to initiate negotiations with them for a master developer agreement. The Southwest Community Works subcommittee members that were present agreed um, and concurred and, and passed their own resolution um, in agreement with, uh, with Kraus Anderson as the master developer candidate. Um, I just wanted to briefly talk about Kraus Anderson and the team, and we do have Jackie Bell here who is the lead um, and uh, the lead for Kraus Anderson as the master developer team. The team includes Timberland, who will do the high density residential on the site, um, Lennar or Cal Atlantic, which is now, now Lennar, which will be responsible for the townhomes on the site that you see in the concept, um, and then Kim Lee Horn, LHB and Systology as consultants to the, pro to the project as landscape architect, uh, civil engineer, and their sustainability consultant. Um, and I did want to just talk through or, or indicate some of the highlights of the response. I know that, that came up through the conversations with the joint working group and the subcommittee. And a lot of it was related to just the experience and the reputation um, of Crofts Anderson as well as their team and their ability to, to deliver and one of the components that was really important is the ability to deliver that truly integrated affordable housing component um, where the, the affordable housing is part of the, um, of, of the uh, mixed income high density residential areas um, as well as the, the access the community space and some of the other um, notes up here and that there are some interesting components that I think we're really excited to learn more about such as the net zero carbon footprint. And I don't know if Jackie you want to talk a little bit more about your team prior to um, to my, me sort of stepping through the next steps. Sure. Um, first, um, thank you so much for having me here. Um, my name is Jackie Bell. I'm a director of development um, from Krause Anderson. Um, we are so excited about beginning this adventure um, with the Watershed District and the city and all of the stakeholders. We know that it is vast and there are many. Um, my background is environmental design, which is pretty unusual for a developer. Um, but nonetheless, here I am uh, with 20 years experience um, on development projects, having just finished um, a mixed-use development project in downtown Minneapolis that I'm really excited to have you come visit um, so you can take a look at some of the projects that we've recently completed. Um, in terms of our vision, um, Michael did a great job walking through, and I think you've had an opportunity to some degree to look at our package, um, but it's important to us, as I think it is to you, that the vision and the experience starts at the curb and it ventures back um, to and through the site and it really leverages the creek and the stormwater features and we couldn't be more excited about working on the massing and the density of everything that's in between. Um, our team is really seasoned and they are all coming together um, in, with the same excitement as I noted, um, both with the for sale as well as the, um, you know, the mixed housing component that we've brought together. It's a great team. Um, Trish from our engineering group, Kimberly Horn, is here with us tonight as well. Um, what else should I note? Um, I think that's about it. I'm happy to answer questions for you um, and dive into anything a little bit deeper that you'd like to hear a bit more about. Okay, we'll let Mr. Hammond continue. Thank you, Trish. Great. 
So next steps in the process, uh, if the board approves the resolution this evening, would be to initiate initiate the negotiation of those terms and agreements, as we mentioned. And this would be uh, um, not necessarily a unique situation, but obviously a little bit newer for the district. And in our partnership with the city, we'd be looking at some sort of uh, uh, three-way agreement in terms of the district still owning some portion of the site and, and its integration into the development that um, Cross Anderson would be leading along with the, the city's involvement um, in that process. So we would work through um, some of the preliminary questions that we developed with the joint working group and the subcommittee following those deliberations and we would work with Cross Anderson to start to address those. Um, tick through the due diligence process with, um, with Cross Anderson and, uh, and go through obviously some of the other important or critical components such as the outreach and engagement and refining the conceptual site plans. And as, as Jackie noted, We've been talking to Cross Anderson about getting a tour of their block that they um, they recently finished in Minneapolis, and that would be a tour we were hoping to invite the board, uh, Hopkins City Council, and our Southwest Community Works Subcommittee, so uh, we'd all have an opportunity to see some of the work um, that Cross Anderson has completed. Which block? Um, I don't know the, the address. It's um, If you are going um, up 35W, um, you see the sign that says Elliott Park on the right. It's really the second block up. Um, it's between 5th and Portland, 8th and 9th. So it's um, what we call East Town now. It's um, a really catalytic site that we've owned for a very long time, KA has owned. And we developed it from a, um, a flat lot, single office, into a really integrated program with an interior courtyard, a hotel, an apartment building, a mixed-use um, tenant building that has a brewery, and then our own office where we brought in three different offices to be located in one place. It's really cool. Yeah, I know what you're talking about now. Yeah. yeah. So we'll, we'll be working to um, get that on, on the calendar, and we'll work with Krauss Anderson and, and let the board know. Uh, we'll be looking probably to a Thursday where we don't have a board meeting, but. Um, stay tuned and we'll keep you posted on that. Um, so this evening, the recommendation from the joint working group is that the district selects Krauss Anderson as the master developer for 325 Blake Road and authorizes the district administrator to initiate negotiation of those terms and conditions of the master development agreement. Um, and I think I would be remiss if I didn't at least note or, or um, give, a, give praise and thanks to all of the developers who submitted responses, but in particular, um, Anderson Companies and Doran, who um, I think did a fantastic job in their interviews um, and really, uh, really stuck with uh, what was a, a, a long process. And so I think uh, we had a lot of really great responses and I think it was, um, it was uh, quite successful. Happy to take any questions. Let me weigh in at this point because unfortunately managers Lopez and Miller aren't here, but the three of us <laughs> were our uh, appointees to the joint working group along with two members of the Hopkins City Council. And the city of Hopkins is having a big do this evening, so the council and all the staff, and they just couldn't get here. Big volunteer recognition. But I have a letter here addressed to the board from Katie Campbell and Aaron Kuznia, who are Hopkins City Council um, members and were on the joint working group. Um, we are writing to voice our strong support for the Joint Working Group's recommendation of Krauss Anderson as the master developer for the 325 Blake Road site. As the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District Board of Managers considers this recommendation, we offer our deep appreciation for the thorough consideration by all parties involved in the discussion to redevelop this site, which will revitalize the Blake Road corridor. As members of the joint working group, we were honored to be a part of the inclusive and thoughtful process that led to this recommendation. From collaborating on the initial draft of the RFQ to reviewing the responses and interviewing the finalists, the process was well managed and attentive to the needs of all partners. The City of Hopkins, Hennepin County, surrounding communities, community groups such as BRCC, residents and master developer candidates all were given ample opportunity to discuss and provide input. As you know, the city and district have a long-standing partnership tradition working together on multiple projects within the Blake Corridor and Minnehaha Creek Greenway. This history has delivered highly impactful projects, including Cobbsville Park, which has provided a community gathering space along Minnehaha Creek that is catalyzing investment in this area. 
These efforts are a testament to the power of partnership and our collective organization's ability to transform community through engagement and action. We are excited to see this partnership take the next step in realizing the community's vision for a transit-oriented redevelopment that integrates affordable housing and invites people into Minnehaha Creek's green space and trail system. We look forward to our continued work together on the 325 Lake Road site. Congratulations on reaching this milestone. Sincerely, Katie Campbell, Erin Kuznia. Um, so let's start with a motion to adopt Resolution 18-051. Manager Second. Shackleton, seconded by Manager Becker. Are there questions for um, Mr. Heyman, uh, Ms. Bell, or others? Sounds like we answered all the questions. <laughs> all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you. I would like to express our appreciation for the joint working group and the hours they spent going over the yes. proposals and the good selection that they made. Thank you, Andrew Becker. It was um, a lot of work, but it was also really exciting. So well rewarded for doing it. If I may just add one more thank you, um, both to Michael and to Anna from NTH. They did both a fantastic job answering our questions along the way and being open um, and available to us anytime we needed and preparing us for the next stages. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And NTH um, folks are here this evening, too. Um, we'll move on to item 11.2, uh, resolution 18-053, um, Ms. Reynolds. Madam President, uh, members or managers, um, I'm for you tonight, I'm kind of on stage two of the uh, professional services RFQs that uh, we, um, we started. We're back asking you to... Uh, direct the administrator to develop agreements with the selected professional services um, contracts and start negotiating those contracts. Back on March 22nd, my first time in front of you, um, we, you authorized the release of the professional services RFQs that um, by Minnesota statute we're required to do every two years. Um, we sent out RFQs for accounting, legal services, engineering services, government relations, and the information technology managed services, which is just the kind of IT help desk type support and server maintenance contract. Um, those, those RFQs were posted uh, on our website. It was sent to the Star Tribune and it was um, posted out in the Star Tribune. And in addition, we did send it out to interested, you know, potentially interested businesses to uh, receive responses. As I said, we received responses for accounting from Red Path and Company. Uh, legal services from Smith Partners, engineering services um, from Wank, um, government relations from Joel Carlson, and then for the information technology RFQ, we did receive responses from corporate technologies and atomic data. Um, we would ask that, um, it, well, in reviewing it, we, uh, the information technology one, we would recommend that we move forward with corporate technologies. They are our current contractor um, in providing the IT support and in reviewing the, uh, the two RFQs, we would recommend moving forward with negotiating a contract with them. Um, minus any questions that you may have in regards to the process, we would ask that you authorize you know, the district administrator to move forward with contract negotiations um, and to um, you know, firm up some details with them and get contracts in place and bring those back to you. Um, we propose our goal would be to bring them back to you on the June 28th um, board meeting for final approval. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt resolution 18053? So moved. Manager Olson, is there a second? Second. second. Uh, Manager Rodness. Are there questions for Ms. Reynolds? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you. We'll move to uh, resolution 18 052. Um, we have uh, Renee Clark and the representative from the city of Edina. Thank you. And I'm here with Ann Cotre, the city of Edina Parks and Rec Director. And uh, I would also like to acknowledge uh, Rick Itis. Uh, Rick is in the, uh, in the audience this evening. Rick is one of the city of Edina's Parks and Recreation Commissioners. 
He is serving on the Arden Park uh, Working Group, and he is also the chair of the committee that's working on the Arden Park Shelter Building. Thank you, Rick, for being here this evening. Thanks. Chair White Managers, Ann and I are here to present the 60% design for the Arden Park Restoration Project for your approval tonight. I'll provide just a brief overview of the project with the design goals, cover the project elements, cost estimates, and next steps in the design process, and throughout integrate um, how the um, various other elements of um, planning internally here are plugging into the project. This is somewhat repetitive of the pre-60% briefing I provided uh, about a month ago, so um, I'll try to cruise through a little bit to, um, to that familiar information. But the Arden Park Restoration Project overall um, combines creek restoration, um, integrated with stormwater management, natural area management, and trails and park facilities. During design development um, from 30 to 60 percent, we looked at site function and layout, and one of the <coughs> more significant changes to that uh, picture is how we reoriented the trails and the shelter building in the center of the park. The goals of the Arden Park project are integrating the watershed district's goals for the Minnehaha Creek corridor of you know, restoring Minnehaha Creek, which has been impacted throughout its corridor here in Arden Park. We're removing a historic dam that's been there since you know, pre-1938. Um, we, throughout the corridor, aim to regionally treat stormwater. Urban runoff has impacted the creek system. Minnehaha Creek and downstream Lake Hiawatha are on the impaired <coughs> waters list. This project provides about 90 acres of regional stormwater management. And then restoring the creek corridor, um, as we've seen throughout the corridor, urbanization has impacted the ecological function and value. In Arden Park, it's not really the built environment per se, but uh, invasive species. Um, and the basically function of the dam impacting the ecological system of the surrounding corridor. We're doing this work integrated with community goals for the park. Um, with upgrades and new f upgrades to new facilities, and then really responding and reacting to the appreciation for nature that has been expressed throughout the public input process of the design. Success for the built environment is obvious. It's um, we'll see the new buildings and the. Um, new trails, an updated playground facility. Success of the ecological improvements will be tracked over time. We're doing this through a project efficacy monitoring plan that's been developed internally by our staff, um, Kaylee Cermak and um, Eric Fieldseth. Kaylee is the lead on um, implementing that um, project efficacy monitoring plan right now. The initial part of the plan is filling data gaps of existing conditions so we can truly measure and compare um, the ecological changes over time in this part of Minnehaha Creek. Um, in Kaylee's absence, Jill is also on the project team and will um, keeping the work going. And uh, note this, this will come up a little bit later, but the, um, some of these things aren't specific to water. It um, also includes how are we improving uplands as well, and that relates to our natural areas management plan, which um, Laura Damiancic is lead, the lead drafter on. Over 2,000 feet of Minnehaha Creek will be restored as part of this project, um, largely in part due to removing the dam and then regrading a new channel. The creek will be more visible and accessible the black boxes you see throughout the corridor indicate creek access points. Important um, to creek access has been fishing, and we've heard a lot about that during uh, concept phase and design development till now. Um, one of the changes that we're, we're noting we're making underneath the bridge, besides removing the dam, which is just upstream of the bridge, under the bridge there's a piece of concrete that goes up 
uh, kind of spans the abutments and part of that is being cut out to provide a more low flow connection. Um, that channel will be lined with rock and we've just been careful to examine and communicate that um, changes here still do not impact the formation of the fishing hole which um, we've heard throughout um, design is really important to people. And this is what the area downstream of West 54th Street Bridge looks like. You'll see on the right, um, there actually is a couple people fishing there, one by the stump and one um, farther off in the distance. Access to fishing here will be incorporated into the design. Uh, part of the floods of 2014 have really impacted and scoured out the bank. That'll be restored as part of this project. And then accesses throughout the park, which we have noted three of them, if you can make them out um, on the screen uh, before you, otherwise it's more detail and easy to look at in your packet. For um, in-stream recreation, we are also exploring a more organic access that isn't overbuilt. Those design details are being developed really between 60 and 90% now um, as we collaborate as a staff and consultant design team. The project is improving and um, building trails throughout the system. There's an existing bridge in the center of the park where the red star is and we're adding a new bridge at the north end of the park for increased circulation. A picture of the um, design that's in your in the 60% is before you. In the north end of the park, circled in green, part of that circulation and connection to nature, um, the program for this park largely includes walking, walking your dogs, walking with strollers and um, those kind of experiences. So that's what we're trying to enhance um, throughout the park and with this project. There'll be a piece of boardwalk through the floodplain after you cross that northern bridge that takes you up a, set of, a new set of stairs to Brookview Avenue. And then along Brookview Avenue, there's a new sidewalk proposed where there isn't one today to facilitate safety goals of the city. Through the center of the park, we call the main arterial trail. It's an eight foot wide trail that's plowed in the winter. And that is being regraded um, off of Brookview Avenue, which is on the left side of the park to be ADA accessible. It's a really steep slope going down to the ice rink today. And that is kind of cutting across the slope, um, incorporating a small retaining wall to save trees and will be of a lesser grade to promote or allow for handicap accessibility. The picture um, for you now is depicting an image of the trail along the right side, if you, um, if you will, it's the east side of the creek. It's intended to be um, a more organic walk experience through kind of a floodplain part of the creek. It, it, it follows Minnehaha Boulevard, but sits about two, three feet below Minnehaha Boulevard. Um, it's something that we're looking at field fitting after the creek is in to respond to where the trees are, how the stream lays out, um, envisioned to be something like two to three feet wide and a uh, type of crushed rock. Stormwater management in the site is accomplished in two ways. The primary way is at the north end of the site with above ground filtration swales. The green arrow at the top is the entry point for about 80 acres of stormwater from a drainage area that goes up to 50th and France. It's largely residential, comes to the creek largely untreated. The system of treatment here, and you'll see they'll recognize those with the um, shaded dark gray, uh, I guess, blobs, if you will, are above ground filtration swales that treat stormwater um, in a treatment train approach and then discharging it to Minnehaha Creek. The area I showed you below West 54th Street is also an area for stormwater management. It treats a smaller acre of a, a smaller area of about five acres, removes about two pounds and that's an underground filtration system. 
And here's a better image um, to depict the stormwater swales and how they fit within the layout of the park. As we've um, been going through the 60% design development process, the city has initiated the development of the shelter building and I'll let Director Katre just give us a brief update on what we've heard there. We began working on the shelter building uh, in April of this year. We have eight members of the public that are participating in the design process. We also have four Parks and Recreation Commissioners and as I mentioned, uh, Commissioner Itis is the chair of the working group for the shelter building. As we've gone through the early concept design and as we've been through the 60% design, we have asked residents a lot throughout the process what they're looking for in a shelter building. Uh, we are working with the watershed district to try to fit environmentally and ecologically into the park while still meeting the recreational needs of the residents. Uh, we have heard very consistent messages from our residents as to what they would like to see in a shelter building. Uh, we're looking at a building of approximately 1,500 square feet. Uh, we're also looking at uh, a strong desire to have a nice outdoor presence uh, with the shelter building. Uh, what we're planning with the shelter building is to have large overhangs on both the north and the south side of the building so uh, residents are able to utilize that um, part of the part of the building year-round uh, with beautiful views toward the playground and also beautiful views uh, looking uh, southerly down the creek we are in the stage of design um, where we haven't made any decisions yet on finishes uh, for the interior or the exterior we've really focused on the size the shape and the orientation of the building so far. Um, staff, city staffs invited me to um, come and listen to these um, shelter building design development um, sessions, and it's exciting to see that move along um, at the kind of a concurrent pace as the rest of the park design. I think we'll be continuing to collaborate as staff to ensure that the um, look and feel and shape of this piece of the project, the playground, all um, fit the um, setting of Arden Park and the design goals established for the project. Natural areas management is the um, fourth piece of this project that we'll cover. Um, this includes managing the vegetation and natural areas um, the creek banks, the wetlands that we're restoring, the floodplain forests, um, as well as the uplands. Um, this also includes um, or relates to the operations and maintenance plan. So the natural areas management plan um, just that will prescribe how we'll manage um, those areas short and long term will drive what we do for operations and maintenance and on what schedule that draft operations and maintenance plans in your packet. Um, it was also provided to city council as part of the 60% design package. Um, I'd like to note um, through the um, culmination of concept design, tree preservation and tree impacts have been a concern of the public. Um, we have provided um, reduced numbers of tree removals as Part of the value engineering process and as we further develop design but um, what has come to light is ash tree management the emerald ash borer is now discovered in edina since this spring and the city forester has um, been advising the project team to consider ash tree management as part of this project it was discussed um, in detail by the parks and recreation commission who recommended the city council to um, include ash tree management as part of the Arden Park design, largely because there's access to a lot of ash trees that aren't accessible normally or under other circumstances. And we are replacing a lot of trees and kind of taking a holistic restoration approach. So ash tree management will be part of that holistic approach. Um, tree removal will be 
determined and phased based on a um, number of factors, including accessibility, um, the trees function in the landscape. Um, the city has chosen to actually treat three specimen trees in the park this year. Um, so conversations probably will continue about how long that that practice occurs. Um, so ash tree management overall will be part of the natural areas management plan. And to note, all trees removed as part of the project will be reused in the construction of the creek banks um, for the creek work. So I think that's, uh, that's a positive for this. And the um, total number of trees we covered at uh, pre-60% was in your packet. The permitting process for the city and the, or for the project is really getting started with the city's publishing of the environmental assessment worksheet, which is mandatory under statute due to the um, impact or restoration of more than 500 feet of stream. City Council, with the approval of 60% design, authorized staff to finalize and publish the EAW. I'm expecting that to be published um, in the coming week. and. Our communication staff will send out notice of that um, as well as have a link to that on our website. It is the City Council that um, takes action on the EAW after the 30-day review period and that is scheduled at uh, their upcoming meeting on July 17th. Other permitting for the project, I've uh, previously noted the Historical Resources Review which we've initiated We've also initiated the Watershed District Permit Review and um, Catherine Sylvia here is the lead with support from Elizabeth. And they are screening the project um, for uh, evaluation of district applicable rules as well. One thing that we flagged so far is the potential for a wetland buffer exception to our rule. Um, and they are analyzing that right now. An updated cost estimate was provided in your packet. The costs have increased since the um, concept phase design. The um, costs there are split out amongst uh, between the city and the district in um, similar project element buckets as in the cooperative agreement, um, but broken out into a bit more detail so we can see where things are changing. Um, the primary change impacting the cost increase are some um, changes to the budget for city facilities, mostly the shelter building. Um, the city has been engaging um, architects and professionals on really cost, being careful to cost out the type of building they're building today um, and comparing the cost of that to the cost of doing that work you know, a few years ago and those costs are increasing. So that's um, kind of the large driver of the cost change. Um, the district's cost um, <coughs> with respect to overall CIP, I believe, was presented. Um, but we are, you know, relatively close to the original estimate. What's going to occur um, now as the 60% review process culminates is a type of value engineering analysis with the city and the district and the consultant team looking at um, a prim stormwater layout will be one of the primary opportunities um, where we might be able to save costs um, in this estimate. Um, also note there is about $130,000 included in the estimate for low impact development um, practices, best management practices that aren't in the concept design right now, but um, we have contemplated bid alternates for things like permeable pavers and other low impact development BMP, so we left that dollar, dollar amount in the estimate. The 60% review, similar to um, the first 30% review, included a public open house. This one had two open houses. We went out to the park on a Saturday morning um, with good attendance and I think it was helpful for everybody just to see you know in real life these areas and how they might change and 
really how close is the building to the rink? Well, it's still really close and just kind of have a you know good understanding of the look and feel of the park and as we talk about the changes to the park. Um, the same um, material was displayed in an open house prior to the Parks Commission meeting earlier this month and then City Council reviewed and approved the 60% design while also authorizing publishing the EAW at their meeting on the 15th. And updated you on the shelter building process um, at our open house in the park. They also started to take input on um, playground design from the public who are there. So um, with board action tonight, we're concluding the 60% design review process. Um, the final thing I want to touch on is communication of the process out to the public and inviting them into the process at these formal checkpoints and opportunities throughout um, is well coordinated between city and watershed district staff um, at the district. Uh, Telly um, and Sarah Bomani are the leads in implementing the communications plan. What Telly and Sarah have recently met about and discussed with city communications staff on is um, proactively thinking about communication as we get into bidding and construction. What are the communication needs going to be then? And then also thinking about communication post construction, um, thinking about data gaps like documentation of existing conditions of pictures and things and those stories we want to tell post-construction about um, the effectiveness of our work, which leads into park programming, um, which we've discussed as well with um, the Education Communications Group, talking about um, site-specific program that you would um, be familiar with, like signage and environmental education related to Arden Park. Um, but also this site in the context of Minnehaha Creek Corridor and its connection to the work upstream and downstream and its role in um, looking at all of the district's you know, goals throughout the corridor of you know, improving the creek and treating stormwater and improving the riparian corridor. And then finally, district-wide, how does this project serve and is, uh, example of the district's balanced urban ecology brand and thinking about um, how do we plan to tell that story as well. So those conversations are beginning and a draft of those plans will be provided at 90%. Um, again, we're here at May 24th, culminating the 60% review. We'll be back to you um, in August or September, really, with the 90% review, which is your final approval of the project. Um, I'll discuss with uh, direct, or, um, our administrator, Mr. Whisker, and um, Chair White, if we should um, have, a, um, like we did with 60%, uh, informal check-in before we um, go out to the public with the um, final 90% so that um, might be added. The um, full bidding process isn't before you on the screen, but we're anticipating a bid award to come to the Board of Managers at the end of December. May I have a motion to adopt Resolution 18052? So moved. Manager Rogness, seconded by Manager Shackleton. Manager Olson. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me, construction to start when? <coughs> Early January. Okay, right after the bids, okay. Uh, two questions on the structures. Um, is that a heated shelter? Yes, it would be. So year-round, it's indoor-outdoor rather than just protection? From the yes, rain. that is correct. Okay. And then how do you deal with your ice rink? Is that a, are those boards left up in the summer or are they removed every year? Yes, Manager Olson, those boards are left up year-round, uh, the hockey rink boards. Okay, so how do you envision the dog park working? Uh, Manager Olson, one of the concepts that we discussed was a potential dog park in that location, and honestly, I'm not sure that that is something that is going to come to fruition or not. Um, we would need to have more conversation, uh, certainly with our Parks and Recreation Commission and the residents. Uh, there was some interest in residents in utilizing that hockey rink as a off-leash dog park during the summer months. 
we do this at another park location where we take the hockey boards and we uh, gate off the open section and uh, it actually works quite well. Uh, one of the reasons uh, that could potentially prohibit that use during the summer um, is our summer playground program. Uh, we currently do not have a summer playground program at that park. Uh, we removed the summer playground program, I believe it was in 2014 when we had repeated uh, flooding and high water in that park. Uh, we moved it to another location and we definitely have a desire with the new shelter building and with the beautiful new park to move a summer playground program back there. Uh, one thing that we've heard from residents uh, regarding dogs in the area is there's an, a lot of off-leash use that's being uh, currently uh, done in the park and we would like to minimize that. Uh, but really, as we heard from residents, they weren't terribly excited about the idea of turning that rink into a, an off-leash dog park. But okay, so that's kind of a, an idea on the drawing. So. Correct. Okay, thank you. Yes. Manager Shepard? There's a, there's a tennis court in my neighborhood that is an unofficial off-leash dog park in the winter, which my dogs, of course, escaped from this winter. But um, <laughs> <laughs> that fan. That it still is wonderful <laughs> and unofficial. So, <laughs> When we were there on the district tour last year, there was a really kind of a soggy lawn. Is that where we're seeing the renovated park lawn? And are those swales going to solve that problem? Chair White Managers, that's exactly the purpose of the swales is to channelize mm -hmm. and keep the water and especially higher flows out of the park. Uh, drier, usable green space is one of the de design goals um, accomplished by removing the dam and all this restoration. Um, the moat area of the park is that area kind of between the trails, the white area on that plan I started with. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, you'll see today that, or when you were out there, it was soggy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was, you know, another reason why That's it was really That's the water, water right. language, right, soggy. Right, soggy, <laughs> unusable, <laughs> unprogrammable. So the um, white space between the trails is mode space. Um, today and would be mode space. Um, other space that you're seeing there will be um, basically all naturally maintained with maybe some minor exceptions. Thank you. Manager Ruggs. I, I'm curious about uh, just the character of the, of the buildings that are going to be developed. Uh, is there a tradition in EDINF or uh, that has you know, evolved over over time that uh, uh, kind of identifies it as you know part of uh, of Edina. Uh, Manager Ragnus, thank you. That's a great question, and that is uh, honestly the biggest conversation that we've been having as part of the design process. We have used the same architect for all of the newer shelter buildings that we've. Uh, installed in our park since 1997. Uh, they all have a similar look and feel, yet um, are different and unique in different neighborhoods. Interestingly, we have had uh, very much of a direction from the residents in the neighborhood toward the design of a building that we installed in 2014-2015 at Pamela Park. Um, the building at Pamela Park is slightly larger, uh, it's in a larger park, um, but it has a shed roof design. It's a very light, open, airy building with a nice, large community space, and the roof design lends itself very well to the outside uh, shade areas uh, mm -hmm. that the residents are looking for. So. Um, still a little bit early to say exactly what it would look like, but that is definitely what the residents have requested. I, I'm an architect, and so I have a, you know, a, a, um, <laughs> a an objective about uh, these kinds of facilities. And uh, uh, for what it's worth, I, I'm really uh, very, my, very much uh, enamored with. Uh, the, the outbuildings 
that are uh, on the uh, Arboretum uh, site. And uh, uh, I think that they have a, a very sort of uh, quiet uh, presence to them. And uh, I think it would be very fitting for, for that kind of a park. Thank you. I didn't remember the work going so much south of the bridge. But you showed us that large scoured bank. Um, is that, has that increased the cost? Was that an ad or had I just forgotten it? Chair White Managers, that's always been part of the okay. project and has been included in the cost estimate. And there was actually um, FEMA funds mm -hmm. um, yep. requested for that. Yeah. That was one of the sites. Okay, thank you. Fishing hole. Any other questions? All those in favor of adopting that resolution say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. And thank nice you for job. coming in. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move to item 13.1, the administrator's report. Mr. Whisker. President White Manders, always my favorite part of the agenda. Um, <laughs> a couple of categories for updates tonight. Um, step through some planning and project updates. <coughs> Excuse me. Staff, uh, planning staff recently attended a climate resilience workshop or think tank, if you will, at the Pollution Control Agency. It's an invite only workshop for about 40. Uh, different staff folks across the state were lucky enough to get some advice and sent some staff as well as the district engineer. They uh, divided up into work groups to talk about climate resilience uh, at the state policy level, local planning and zoning, infrastructure and natural resources. Um, and I think that was the first of, of many, so we'll keep you posted. It was um, the interesting to report back is there doesn't seem to be um, tremendous center mass or concentrated thrust from that state level in terms of pushing resilience planning policy down and you know with uh, changing precipitation patterns and our ongoing issues up and down the creek and upper watershed um, just want to keep that in the forefront of the board's mind that that might be continue to be an opportunity where the district could exercise some leadership in planning so we're staying tuned to that um, regarding some of the uh, high groundwater issues in South Minneapolis, you did uh, receive a copy of a letter that we received from a resident, uh, Ms. Uh, Miller, and uh, Tiffany Schaufler put a tremendous amount of work into coordinating a response across several different agencies, and you saw that response, and that's gone out the door. Um, you did hear from President White, so it's a little bit redundant, but the Lessard Sands and Outdoor Heritage Council is a standalone bill advanced for $567,000 of district funding for our Six Mile Creek Halstead Bay restoration project for about 2,400 acres of uh, restoration out in that geography. And hopefully, uh, once the governor signs that, that will put us with some funding starting July 1st. And you heard about the readiness planning and deadlines and committee on that. Um, in Painter Creek, there is also some FEMA-funded uh, FEMA damages, and the repairs to those have been initiated uh, following the contracting and everything this uh, week on um, May 21st for the cattle crossing up on uh, Mr. Johnson's property um, up on, along the main stem of Painter Creek. So that work's underway, and uh, we'll be sure to get construction updates as that, that work proceeds and concludes. Um, staff's also been engaged, uh, continue to be engaged in the watershed based funding pilot program with the Board of Water and Soil Resources. And as you know, they're kind of working on deadline under Bowser guidelines um, to develop a program for prioritizing the funding that's available through this new approach. So, Becky Christopher has been working uh, within a collective of Hennepin County, and the, now they've rolled the program out to uh, member communities. So, the cities have started to get engaged. And as you know from the reports that you've been receiving on that, the district has really been pushing for an approach that prioritizes projects based on their resource needs and uh, projected outcomes. Um, and that's something that we've really been pushing uh, different analytical tools and, and rubrics into. Uh, for now, with this short deadline, the collective has tended, uh, trended more towards a formula-based approach for this first round of funding. Um, so you'll be getting a report on that coming up here pretty soon because staff will request authorization to submit applications for this watershed-based pool of funding. As it stands under the, the way the formulas are shaking out, uh, the district would uh, stand to receive approximately a quarter million dollars for um, the 
Hennepin County portion of the grant funds which are being proposed to be applied to 325 Blake Road and or Arden Park. Um, and that's in addition to the $95,000 that we might stand to uh, receive in Carver County for the Wasserman West project. So you'll see that coming up in, uh, in meetings here pretty soon. Um, you'd also requested during a recent discussion with me to be kept abreast of conferences and presentations that staff are giving outside the organization. So I want to give you a, a quick rundown of some that are on the docket. We'll start by um, uh, pitching left here to Mr. Smith. Um, he's been tracking a conference that might be coming up here later this year around eco districts, and that's something that he's been kind enough to partner with staff on developing an abstract for submittal. And if you just give a minute to articulate why that's a, a good conference and a good opportunity for us, I'd appreciate it. The, there's a national organization based in Portland called Eco Districts, which promotes kind of a three pronged effort uh, climate uh, resilience. Uh, environmental quality, sustainability, and equity. And uh, they uh, choose a different uh, city in the country for their annual summit meetings, and then try to organize efforts uh, in that, that city. So Minneapolis-St. Paul is hosting the annual summit uh, in October, and I'm participating in the planning committee. And uh, we had identified that 325 Blake Road might be uh, one example site to kind of lift up the visibility of the district's work in partnership with the city as well as look at their uh, eco-district protocol and uh, apply it and see um, how we might uh, use that in benefit. So the, the timing I think seems uh, good in terms of uh, the needs of uh, the district to move along but also benefit from engagement. So we're working with Mr. Whisker and Mr. Heyman and and uh, probably the city of Hopkins and Carl Sanderson. Wonderful. Well, yeah, and a couple of others here. In June, the Engineering Water Resources uh, Conference, the international one, is coming to town, and we've secured a spot to present there for the Minnehaha Creek Greenway. So um, Mike Heyman and I are arm wrestling over who gets to go do that. Um, also, Bassett Creek uh, Watershed Commission has uh, reached out to us and asked for us to come work with a new committee that they've developed uh, for a capital project prioritization. It's an analog to our planning and policy committee. And in talking to Laura Jester, the, the executive director over there, she uh, relayed to me that they're, they're trying to move away from projects that are scattered geographically, um, not just uh, react to municipal requests, focus their work, and uh, develop more private partnerships. And uh, we both collectively reflected that sounded a lot like where we were and the conversations we were having in 2009. And she's seen uh, our model presented a number of different times and is asking us to engage in a series of workshops uh, with that committee to, to see if we can provide some lessons learned and some advice. So um, I think that's positive news too, that there's some uh, desire to emulate what we're doing out there in the watershed community. And then finally, uh, in the conference uh, realm of things, I mentioned after we got back from National APA that we had a little bit of a strategy that we're working in terms of following up uh, from a, a subgroup of uh, National APA. And there's a group of APA called Planning and Water Connect. So it's a group of APA members that are specifically focused on uh, regional water resource planning and looking for, uh, they've started a new conference. It'll be in Kansas City this September and they're looking for uh, case studies across the nation for successful regional water resource planning. And they've invited us to sit on a panel and talk about our comprehensive plan model and, and focal geography model. So that's something that um, we're going to learn a little bit more about and then bring back to the board here pretty soon uh, once we know a little bit more about what the conference is and costs and timelines, that sort of thing. Um, I was going to talk about some legislation updates, but President White covered those, and you get the mod update in front of you, so we can skip over that. And uh, kind of the final category is uh, communications, and um, Telly and her team are always hard at work, and uh, on May 17th we received two awards from the Minnesota Association of Government Communicators. Uh, we received a one-time uh, award, first place award for the Lake Minnetonka map that was developed. And then we received a merit-based award for our 50th anniversary programming. And I have both of those here in front of me that you can take a look at after the meeting, and those will go up um, over there on the, on the side. 
Um, also, we've got a couple articles here that I can share with the board. We've been trying to get the message out about the um, innovative operation of the Grays Bay Dam and how it's benefiting both sides of the dam, both the lake community and the creek community during a lot of our record precipitation events, um, effectively managing and actually reducing flood risk and flood profile. And uh, Telly's gotten us a couple of uh, articles here in uh, both the South Lake Neighbors Magazine, which is distributed to residents in Excelsior Shorewood area, and uh, the Lake Minnetonka Community Guide, uh, which goes to YZ Excelsior Chambers. So, um, some good press there. And to finish regarding Gray's Bay Dam, we're actually um, um, coming out of a little bit of a wet period. It's getting dry and it's going to be hot over this long weekend. And the lake's dropped a little bit. We're at 929.3 and only discharging 20 CFS. So, we made it through the spring melt without any major issues on either side of the dam. So, good news there. Happy to take questions. Any questions, Mr. Whisker? No, thank you. Manager Wilson? He made a comment about Tiffany's letter, the Miller letter. Yes. I just wanted to say that <clears throat> there were some pretty strong challenges that brought that letter to need to be written. And uh, the response was accurate, it was polite, it was uh, very detailed, and a lot of work went into it. And I uh, just wanted to say thanks again for representing us really well with that. And, uh, and thank you for signing it, but uh, it's not every day we get to write something that goes to the governor's office, mm -hmm. but uh, that one did, so. Yeah, now he knows my name. Yeah. <laughs> and well done to both of you. We, you know, we get a certain amount of information, but I got new information from that letter I thought was very yep. informative for me, too. Yeah, I think to, to that point, we're uh, <clears throat> treating that as a base. You know, we're continuing to build our communications for what's actually happening out there. And it's trying to bring all that science together and just yeah. dial it in in terms of what's actually happening. And I think uh, Tiffany did a really good job pulling that together. Okay. Thank you. All, all set. Meeting is adjourned.